I want to begin with our first panel, which is uh, the title of which is Innovation, Investment, and Competitiveness on the World Stage. I want to invite up our two speakers, uh, Ladislav Miko and uh, Pekka Pesinen. Please, please come in. Uh, Vladislav is a former Czech Minister of the Environment. He's currently the Deputy Director General for the food chain at DG Sante. And Pekka, who is, as you can tell from the name, is Finnish, uh, was an official in the Finnish uh, government and is currently the Secretary General of, uh, is it Copa Kogeka or do you actually, uh, Ko Kojeka, there you go. I will not ask you to... Uh, spell it out for us, <laughs> but everyone knows it's the, one of the main uh, um, farming lobbies here, here in Brussels. You know, as we were preparing, I was, I was thinking about um, this area of, of coverage. We, we hosted a couple of events and, and talked to people about, you know, how, how really to approach agriculture. And uh, one theme um, sort of came up all the time, and uh, it's a sentence that keeps sticking in my head is, um, uh, I won't say who said this sentence, but the sentence is, um, Europe is becoming a food museum, and discuss. Uh. <laughs> Let me Are start you asking me or you Pekka? first? You I first. Mean, you first. <laughs> first of all, I would ask. Actually, I don't know who invented that, but uh, the, the, uh, is it set with a meaning that it is something wrong or it is something good? <laughs> because we are quite proud about the quality and type of food which is produced in Europe, and that makes us the most successful exporter of the food in the world. So the question is, do we really want to change that? And if so, to what extent and in which particular characteristics? So I mean, for me, it is a nice statement, but we are quite proud of our cheeses and our, I don't know, ham from, from uh, Czech I should not mention any particular country. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Czech beer I can mention because of I come course. from Czech Republic, yes. But, but this will annoy the Belgian colleagues. Huh? <laughs> Very different kind of beer. Um, Pekka, do you see it as a positive statement too? Well, I certainly would like to echo what uh, Ladislav just said. We're quite proud of our farmers and all the foodstuffs and uh, the, the tradition and the, the expertise that they have. We can't call it a museum in a sense, in a negative sense. But then there is a sense of a, a seed of truth in, 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 the, in this statement that we have, to be, we have to remain vigilant that this tradition and this expertise and these excellent products wouldn't become a museum. It needs to respond to the world stage, world need uh, demand of the consumers, modern consumers, both in Europe and abroad. And I think this is, this is what the, the essence of this statement would, would be. But the, the statement, to be fair, was not said as a compliment. Uh, and, <laughs> and what it implied is that, uh, and this is from people who are uh, working obviously in the sector, that Europe is lagging behind, specifically the US and Japan, in innovation, in, uh, uh, in, in the way that you produce food, the way it's, uh, the way it's marketed as well. Um, if I may, I mean, it is rather not about the food as such, but about the way how to get it produced. And there we can discuss uh, in, in which, uh, let's say, sense we are lagging behind and for what reasons, okay? I, I don't really think that even the people in the United States or Japan would deny uh, the European food as they know it is, is something what they like to keep. They don't want necessarily to change it for a pink, pink jelly or, or something like that. Uh, so yes, it is rather about are we able in the present circumstances to produce that excellent food, that excellent products, at the price which is here on the market using the standard and historical approaches in production. And this is indeed for discussion. So in the, in the view of the commission, is, is Europe innovating enough? I don't have, uh, to be honest, I don't have any particular measure what is, where is enough and where is not enough. Uh, we claim publicly that we want to improve and to boost the innovation. So this could be also translated as we have a feeling we could innovate more 
if we had a feeling that we are the most innovative uh, economy in the world, probably it will be not at the program as a priority to boost innovation. But on the other side, I think that <laughs> this discussion today, it's for me very interesting to see what is actually the expectation. The innovation should be for certain purpose, not for itself, okay? And what we really want to achieve at what cost and which should be the result. I mean, that's, that's a very broad discussion. It's not that simple, in my view. Okay, what, what would you want to see achieved and, and, and what would you want to see public policy push? What sort of innovation does, does Europe need? Well, I would like to refer to actual, your pre predecessor's comment from uh, 2008, I believe, that, and in reference to the 1107 regulation on placing plant protection products to the market. And at that time, I, I re remember this vividly. And we were told that European Commission, with this new proposal, and uh, let's say, uh, at the end, a decision of the Union to uh, reform the relevant EU legislation, forces the sector to come up with a safer, more sustainable, better product, especially in PPP sector. And, uh, we supported this wholeheartedly. This never happened. We, we have very few products put to the marketplace to the extent that the farmers are actually s seeing the consequence in their daily work. Uh, we've seen this already at the marketplace. Rapeseed production last year went down because of this, primarily. Of course, some uh, other elements were there too. But then what we are asking here is that the European Union would only follow its own recommendations and all commitments and they didn't come through. And this, I think, especially in the in case of innovation, is, is a crucial element because we simply forgot, um, also from our perspective, but then especially the Commission and European institutions, that we are not in a situation where we just order stakeholders to come up with innovative solutions. You have to create the framework and the environment for that. And I think that's where we, uh, let's say, fell short in the EU. What is the main break on innovation, though? Um, meaning uh, in terms of the precondition or? No, what is, what is stopping it from, from happening? I mean, you could say that it seems an outsider that public opinion, for example, seems a very strong break on innovation, that you know, Americans generally accept that GMO is safe and, and, and fine and buy beef, you know, food which, which has been you know, altered that way. That clearly is not the view, public view here in Europe. I think it's, it's more to do with the market reality. Um, I think the current administrative cost to bring in new products is, is really high, too high for the, for the let's say, expected returns of the market. We lack uh, predictability of the EU regulatory framework, and that is a big problem for the operators, not only the, the industry in question, because we need those investments, not only in agriculture, but in the whole agri-food chain, and we need to have a predictable uh, legal environment to do that. Especially in the agricultural sector, the, the average investment cycle is 20 to 30 years. And the margins that we are talking about are relatively narrow. Not to talk about the industry, I have yeah. to say, John Charles. But, then, uh, but in this respect, we need to have a predictability of the legal environment for the union. Because the union and the commission in, in this respect are in charge of keeping up this, this framework for the for the operators. If I may, uh, I do agree that predictability is important, but is really, do you foresee dramatic changes of the legal framework? I think it's much more about the implementation of the existing framework rather than that it is changing every second day. It's not the case. First of all, to change the legislation or to come with any change, even I would say with my experience, even with what I really consider to be a positive and simplifying change, is almost impossible. So I mean the, the legislation is pretty rigid actually. But the implementation is a problem. Huh? And I think that uh, we have to say when we speak about the innovation rate in the Europe, that we are managing a system where you have uh, actually dozens of scrutinies on the way. I was trying to explain to American colleagues, they, they always don't understand. And I say, while, okay, you have maybe, uh, you know, two chambers of your parliament to agree and then the president to sign, we have 28 parliaments plus European parliament plus all the colleagues, you know, in the other sectors in the European Union. 
And on top of it, in the political dispute, in the national level, usually the winning party has a majority in the parliament. Uh, there is nothing like majority of the commission in the European Parliament or in the national parliament. So we have to convince all of these people that the proposal is a good one, whatever you propose. And that makes the system to work longer. It's natural, it's logical, but that was the decision of the Europeans. We want to have that system. So, I mean, uh, we should not criticize what we on the one side demand, that everyone has a say, on the other side, we want everyone has the right to say, but not to say anything just yes. I mean, this is not the way. We have simply re re respect the system. But what would you um, uh, say if you had uh, as an American columnist who was saying that if only we could be China for a day, we could just sort of solve all these problems. It's kind of been discredited by recent events in China, but in any case, if you could be China for a day, you could get anything you want. What would be the three things you would just put on the books tomorrow that would make our lives so much better. I, I would not, I'm sorry, I'm coming from former communist country. I would not take, I would not take a second of China, okay. if I may. I mean, Pekka, so what, what, what would you see public policy do? Let's say we remove all these uh, political hurdles, you know, you sort of, uh, obviously have spilled them out, um, you know, they're so numerous here in Europe, but if, if you got rid of those hurdles, what would you s want to see happen? Well, I, I, would like, I would like to see consistency within, within this implementation. And uh, one good example that actually prohibits us or it prohibits the industry to come forward with new products, at least to a certain extent, is, is this so-called guidance document in, in EFSA that, that is being used at the moment without any public scrutiny or any public discussion whether, whether that should make the decisions or whether that should be used in the decision making in order to stop the whole process of developing new products. We, we have a problem with that. We have high respect for the work of EFSA and we fully support EFSA's work in general. But this guidance document be guidance document has created a situation where actually we don't see any progress. In no, no new processes are coming forward. Let me um, open the floor to questions. Uh, I just wanted to react very shortly because I agree with that. Uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, uh, I want to remind that the, the whole idea of guidance documents came out from the fact that the industries wanted to know what is expected to be submitted in order to be successful with submission. Then we went to more and more accurate and this detailed and, and precise explanation of that and it makes the whole document really very complex. I agree. Mm. Uh, on the other side, you say you are calling for the broad uh, consultative process. At the same time, I can bring you a very big uh, uh, pile of papers saying uh, how not independent EFSA is because it is too much consulting with everyone. I mean, within that framework, it is indeed, I mean, I, I, I am not over defensive. I mean, I am asking EFSA to work on that, simplify and make it more doable. But at the same time, they live in the situation where they are accused every day to be over open to consult everything, what is a scientific approach, which is well defined, science is clearly defined, so where is the problem? So, I mean, again, it is just to explain that to find the right solution in that context is not pretty easy. Yeah, but let, why don't we let the, the EFSA do it, it's, its part where it's, they are really good in terms of their assessing the risk. This is actually the genu let's say, original, yes. uh, let's say, task for EFSA. And not go to the, uh, to the risk management side and leave the risk management to the, to the commission or other I, competent I institutions. I mean, we always say that. Right? It's not about the risk management if they say what should be submitted for the risk assessment. It's not risk management. The problem is that they set up at the highest known expertise level what they expect. And for the practical implementation, that causes sometimes the problems. The question is how far we want to be really also up to date with the science in the assessment. We can say, okay, we don't go to the highest bar, we go a little bit lower. Who will decide where? So it is not simple. Um, I think that uh, we are now on the avenue to broader possibility to consult. We are trying to find a way. We do the refit of the 
the food regulation, as you know. We are looking also on the roles of EFSA in that sense. So to allow something what is known from other agencies in terms of clarification of what is needed from industries when they apply. But we have to be sure that this will not influence the result itself. So it is very delicate work. But okay, we are in the process, I believe, that we will have some improvement in that. Terrific. Let me um, open up the, the floor to questions. I want to uh, please uh, um, introduce yourself and, and ask a brief question. And go ahead right here in the, in the, in the front. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, compliments for the event. Uh, my name is James Coogan. I'm with Ethanol Europe Renewables. We're Europe's largest bioeconomy investor. And uh, I noticed in the preamble to the event and in the discussion to date, the bioeconomy hasn't been mentioned. And we really believe that the bioeconomy can sustainably drive demand and innovation in agriculture in Europe. And that with not huge tweaks to the policy environment, it could actually be unleashed as a stimulus. Uh, what would your comments be on that? Bio, bioeconomy? Well, bioeconomy is, is a crucial element of the, of the future growth of the sector. Green growth, as we say that in Copa and Corsica, are very much based on new innovative solutions involving um, biological processes. As an agronomist, I'm very pleased to see that biological process linked with economics. And this is what we talk about in bioeconomics. And we know that we can deliver. And then that's also something that we're pushing the European Commission to allow us to do those, those valuable, uh, let's say, additions to the process, because we have to respond to the sustainability and food security need. And bioeconomy is, is a crucial element of this bigger picture. So that in order to do them, do them both, we have to produce more with less. Bioeconomy, by definition in our books, is actually one of the solutions there. If I may answer, this is, in my case, you are really speaking to converted person. I am soil biologist and soil ecologist, so I have a very clear idea about what is getting wrong and what could be done about that. And the, 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 the ecological and biological processes as a driver of the future is, it's not an option, it's a must. We will otherwise simply fail. So this is for me clear. But let me to say two things. First, if we say bioeconomy, I can sign, but it, my perception of bioeconomy may be different than the perception of someone else what bioeconomy means. So we should be very specific what we really mean by that term. That's first. And second, it is also very useful that you mention it because from the, from the beginning of this discussion, I wanted to say that while I see that as extremely important part of the process, which is the development of plant protection products or GMOs, if you wish, the innovation in agriculture is much broader and much more than only that. And we also have to speak about there are things which we need to do immediately within the present model of intensive farming, present price level, volatility of market, etc. This is one thing. And the other thing is something that is a little bit farther behind the horizon for the future because many trends of today with the present intensive farming, even if we are doing the best we are able to do, we cannot sustain for the longer term. And we have to think about the principally different solutions, innovative solutions, but they are not in the number of pesticides to be adopted. It is different approach. And there are some elements already, we discussed that, we are moving there, but I think slowly. And last sentence, I'm sorry, um, uh, I heard here, um, uh, we speak about the economy and the food security, and let me now to play my role of DDG of, of, of DG Sante, and I would add food safety. It is not only about amounts, it is also about the final quality of the food, and apparently many people believe that if we secure sufficient amount of the food, it will be sufficiently safe, but this is not true. These things may be not connected, and we need to take care that they are. Is organic farming um, not innovative as a responser? No, I, 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 I don't think uh, organic farming is, is a type of farming which is not innovative or non-innovative. It is one segment in a puzzle. It needs to be developed. It brings many new solutions or old new solutions which can be used in the future, but it's not the solution or the only solution, certainly not. Let me get some uh, more questions from, from the audience. Please uh, 
raise your hand. Um, Rob Graf with the European Landowners Organization. Uh, we represent 64 associations of private landowners, foresters, farmers, all types of countryside users. Um, I had one remark and a question as well. The first remark is, and I was very happy that Ladislav just picked it up, is that we should be really careful not to say <clears throat> agricultural innovation equals GM. Because if we do that, then we box ourselves into a very dark corner. You know, there, there's big data, there's drone technology, there's precision farming, there's integrated pest management. There's all these wonderful things going on that society seems to quite like. I've never heard anyone say, no, don't put a sensor on your tractor. You know, I've never heard anyone say that kind of thing. So for one, I think that's really important to keep in mind. And my sort of more critical remark is that um, the problem with innovation seems to be more twofold. The first part seems to be that we like to ban things that are good or seem, are perceived as not good, but then because the approval project, uh, approval times, and also the, the development times are eight to 10 years, is if you squeeze out certain products today, tomorrow the insects, the bugs, the, pro the pests, they will still be there. And if our members have to wait eight to 10 years or four to five years for a new good product to come online, what can we advise our members to do the day after you've banned a product? Because we have to do something and you have to, you know, have an equivalent thing that works, we have to have another product that works, and that might also have problems. So the question is, you ban it today, what do you do tomorrow? Not two years after, not five years after, but what do you do the, growing, the next growing season? Uh, my very fast answer to that is, is exactly what I meant by looking a little bit behind the horizon of today. Uh, the, the, the point is that, no, we cannot just stop today with use of, if you wish, pesticides, because that would be the consequence. On the other side, we also have to stop to use the pesticides which are harming the, the human health. I mean, nobody will uh, pardon me if I say I don't care. That's impossible. That's our role. But, but the point is, uh, I mean, I have to mention in many cases where the transition period was needed, the legislation thinks about the transition period and what is happening as a rule, not as an exemption. We put 10 years transition period, 10 years is happening nothing, and only in the moment when it should be banned, the people wake up and start to think what we are going to do tomorrow and ask for prolongation. So we should take seriously our own legislation. And if there is a transition period, within that transition period, we have to address the problem so we can implement what was agreed. And this is the problem, in, not in all cases, but in many cases. And it's not only here, it is in animal welfare, it is in plenty of other things, where after 10 years of waiting, we just wake up and say, okay, ah, we have had to develop something alternative, but we don't have it. This is not the way. But I really think that what is pushing this development to the large part is also the economic development. I think the part of this debate should be how much are the producers pushed by the economic pressure to do what they do? I think this is a very relevant thing and should not be forgotten. Uh, well, I think we, we need to keep in mind that in line with what, what you said, this transitional period is needed. But then why didn't we follow this transitional period for the neonicotinoids? Because the, uh, Europe, a lot of European farmers, in, especially in arable crops, are quite frustrated that by banning immediately the, the neonicotinoid from their use, we actually force the farmers to go to practices that, are, that do not make them competitive. And actually, I could challenge that in, in some respect, they were not also beneficial for the environment, to the contrary. And so if we talk about innovation and the, the decision making of the European Union is like this, I find it very difficult to motivate my members and their members in order to to produce more in a more efficient manner when we see a decline in the marketplace, higher cost for producers, consequently economics disappearing below the production of rapeseed, for instance. And we have some figures from the marketplace now. Oh. We need this uh, consistency the EU legislation in this respect. I buy that, but this particular case, I mean, I have been discussing a million times, and we didn't have at a given time uh, the scientific evidence that we would not make a mistake uh, if we don't stop the use. So, I mean, I have to rely in that, whether I like it or not, I put aside, uh, I have to follow the scientific advice of the agency which I have for that purpose. This is why we have this agency. 
And in many cases, I don't like what comes out. A kind of personal feeling is different. But I am not the one to say that me, big bureaucrat, I know better than my scientific institute what is right. I mean, we get a clear statement and I have to work with that. My colleagues, not me, of course. <laughs> Okay, so one last question, and then we should just wrap up. Please go ahead. Yes. Behind you, thanks. Okay, Franz Eversheim from Bayer. Uh, I have two questions, actually, hopefully provocative enough for each of you <laughs> <coughs> to, to get a straight answer. So first, to uh, Ladislav Miko again, um, to the guidance documents. I know you, uh, this neonic ban was based on a guidance document which is not even in place yet, since two years, more than two years, because the member states reject to vote on it. Um, and in general terms, we see that more and more guidance documents are being uh, uh, coming through, through the, from the Commission, which have a sort of quasi-legislative measure. So basically, you bypass a normal legislative procedure by uh, guidance documents, which really cause us a lot of problems. So uh, I'd like to hear your comment on this one. Uh, it's also true, by the way, for GMOs recently. And for PECA, um, we are more and more under pressure to increase or do something about increase for increase of biodiversity. Where do you see the role of farmers to work on more or improve biodiversity? Cannot we switch the questions? <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> no, my answer would be, I mean, I already mentioned about the, uh, um, about the guidance documents. This is something that was demanded by industry to be better orientated what is expected. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, we don't have any particular procedure for that. This is not a legislation, but we try to have a document which would say from EFSA, at least this is what we demand from EFSA before we discuss with the member states, to have a document where we can, with a high level of certainty, say if you follow that, the result would be positive. So you will not be stuck on the way. This is what we demand and what is, what is uh, the purpose, okay? Um, as I said, it went because there is more and more detailed questions. It, it gets too complex and maybe in some cases difficult to implement. That's why we are now trying to find a new model. But the, the evolution was like that. That was meant as being the help for the applicant to know that the file is complete in advance. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm tempted to say that, uh, by definition, European farmers need that biodiversity for their own business because we need to have farmers' solutions suited to their specific needs and their conditions. And they all, the 12 million farmers, 11 million farmers, they are slightly different, always. So this is kind of fundamental starting point. But if we go for the pesticides or insecticides, uh, side, I think uh, the, the crucial element is integrated pest management, which actually incorporates the, all those measures, technical, um, chemical, you name it, whatever tools we have available in order to tackle those problems, taking into account the specific characteristics and conditions of that farm and the crops and a product that is being uh, produced. Uh, I find it a bit strange, in fact, that in, in the program that you have here today, you discuss integrated pe pest management without farmers' presence. It's the farmers who are supposed to deliver the integrated pest management practices uh, in the field. And uh, ever since 1st of January 2014, please correct me if I'm wrong with the date, uh, the farmers actually had to implement this. And so this is our response. We, luckily enough, we have some tools available in the Common Agricultural Policy Framework in the first pillar and second pillar. But then, especially with our stakeholders, industries, uh, also downstream industries, retailers, uh, catering industry, we could develop some specific measures where that biodiversity could be enhanced. Actually, we, we have a farmer on our next uh, panel, uh, so maybe we can... Uh, I took note of that too, uh, actually, yes. I can, uh, raise that question with him. But I want to really want to thank both you, Pekka and, and Laszlov, and join me in, in, in thanking them for um, getting us started on a, a strong note.